Good evening. Good evening. God is good? All the time. Ah, more conviction. God is good? All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. I praise God for the privilege that he has given me to share with you tonight his word. And I thank you all for coming tonight, for joining us in our worship. Everyone is welcome indeed in the family of God. And I hope that later on we can have uh, more time to fellowship with one another after this. Thank you once again for coming tonight. So our study this week, the Jesus you don't know. And tonight's topic is unclean Jesus. Let's have a quick prayer, please. Father God in heaven, we need you in our midst we need the Holy Spirit to be in our hearts so that we, have, we can have an understanding of your word. And not just that, so that you can give us the humility of Jesus to accept whatever truth we can find from your word that will reveal the real condition of our hearts. Help us, dear God, as a church to trust your word tonight and to humble ourselves before you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, I thank God that the order of the message this week was put in such a way. Because our lesson last night was related or is related to our topic tonight. That's why when Brother Eliel was sharing something, I'm taking down some notes to add to what we can ha study and learn tonight. So praise the Lord for that. Last night, we have studied about what again? Jesus cutting family bonds. And now we have a better understanding of what family really is. More than blood relation, more than earthly and temporary relation, God is inviting us to join in an eternal belongingness to his family, right? And what is the family that Jesus defines once again? Those who do the will of the Father. Those who do the will of the Father are my brothers and sisters and mothers. So if I lived during Jesus' time, if I was there, right there at that moment, and heard that, oh, so Jesus' family are the ones who do the will of God, I might have some questions. I might say, so what are the will of God? If I want to be a part of the family of Jesus, what is the will of God? Is it the set rules and standards that my synagogue leaders have taught me? Is that the will of God? I might have that question if I lived in that time. Because during the time of Jesus' ministry, it was a popular belief that those who did not meet the standard that the Jewish leaders have imposed on their fellows were considered outcasts of the society. Well, that's kind of discouraging, right? And they were considered sinful people who do not deserve a, a chance for salvation. They were considered unclean. And who among you here can tell me who are the ones considered unclean in that time, in those times, in the first century, in Jesus' time? Anyone? Who are the ones considered unclean by the society? Tax collectors? People with leprosy? Prostitutes? Samaritans? Very good. Roman soldiers and their leaders? Sorry? Foreigners, those that are not Jews. Very good, thank you. So these are the ones who are considered outcasts, unclean of the society, even those with physical deformities. So at that time, many also who assume to be doing the will of God believe that in order for them to stay or remain in a perfect religious status, perfect spiritual condition, they cannot and must not associate themselves or go with the unclean. 
the sinners, the sinful at that time. Today, today, tonight and today, I combined it, today. <laughs> today, contrary to popular beliefs, Jesus loved to mingle with the outcasts. And this we already know, those who are living today. But tonight, we need to have a better understanding of what Jesus really means about mingling with the outcasts and who are the outcasts of today. I want to invite you all to open the Bible with me. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. And let's see. These are some stories where Jesus mingled with the outcasts. We'll learn from him. Luke 19, 1 to 10. Are you there? Say amen if you are there. Praise the Lord. So this story is about who? Zacchaeus. So let me summarize the story for you. Jesus was entering and passing through Jericho. And there was this man. He was a tax collector. And his name was Zacchaeus. And he was not just a tax collector. He was the chief tax collector. He was rich. And at that time also, he was seeking to see Jesus. But then, because people are so many, he couldn't press through. He was small in stature. He had to went ahead and climb up a tree. Children, you remember the story? Climb up a tree. And he, to, he waited for Jesus to pass by. He knew that Jesus would pass by that way. And then when Jesus passed by that way, sure enough... Jesus looked up and addressed Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, come down. Hurry, quickly. I must, today I must abide at thy house. That is what King James Version has put it. I must abide at thy house. Wow. Again, who was Zacchaeus? Tax collector. He was considered an outcast at that time. And Maybe when Jesus said that, these people were like, huh? Why? I mean, can't he just come to our house? Why, why would he choose a tax collector who has been stealing money from us or has been cheating? See, this man, the chief of tax collector, he was rich. And probably people have hated him or hated, hated him a lot because of the extreme greed of, for wealth that he had. And because of this, the Jews avoided any contact with tax collectors. They were considered outcasts. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. All right. Why did Jesus decide to dine in his house? Anyone? <coughs> Why did Jesus decide to dine in his house? He wanted to bring salvation to this man. And brothers and sisters, we'll go back to our Bible verse later. <coughs> God bless you. Thank you. Sorry for that distraction. Let's get back. Jesus wanted to bring his salvation to that house, to Zacchaeus' house. And I want you to, to let that sink in. He, because there is a divine guarantee for all of us who are living today from this story. This is the divine guarantee. In God's fold, no one, even if, a, if you are considered an outcast, no one is overlooked. No one in God's family is overlooked. And no one is left unaided. No one is left unaided. 
and everyone that will submit to be saved, Jesus will rescue. Is that, is that a hope for all of us? Yes, because there are times that we feel that we are so non-redeemable, that we have done such and such, and we don't feel that we deserve such forgiveness, but then God is reminding us, even if we feel like we are an outcast at some times, those who will submit to be saved, Jesus will rescue. Another example, John chapter 4. This is a story about a woman. John chapter 4. Are you there yet? Amen. All right. So Jesus had Jesus have to go to Galilee, but he had to go through a place, and that is called Samaria. He had to. He had to go through Samaria. And then when he reached a certain town in Samaria, he sat down near Jacob's well. It was at noontime. And then a woman came, a Samaritan woman came. And he spoke to this woman. And he asked, what did he ask? Drink? Or can you give me water? Can you give me a drink? This woman knowing that this is a Jew asking him, asking her, was surprised. Why are you asking me for water, knowing that I am a Samaritan and you are a Jew? So we can see in this story that the woman was surprised. But then Jesus said, if you know who is asking you, if you know what I can give you, and if you know that what I can give you is a living water, then you will be blessed. But sir, living water, you have nothing to draw water. Where will you get this living water? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. But anyone who I will give this living water will never be thirsty again. And there, are, there will be inside of them a spring of life that will never run dry. And it will, be for, it will well up for eternity. Sir, I want this water. I don't want to be thirsty again. I don't want to keep coming back here. Can you give me this water? Go call your husband and come back. Oh, but I don't have a husband. Oh, you have said it well. You don't have a husband. You have had five husbands. And, what, and who you have now is not your husband. You have said true. And this woman, how did this man know? How did this man know? Sir, are you a prophet? Because we worship in this mountain, but the Jews said that we worship that, that the real worship place is in Jerusalem. Oh. And and the woman Jesus replied, you woman, believe me that the time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither here in this mountain nor in Jerusalem, but you will worship him in spirit and in truth in your heart. And also he said that you Samaritans, you worship what you do not know, but Jews, we worship what we know for salvation belongs to the Jews. You know, when I read that, I was like, well, is that not, is that, is that, is that not a little strong to say that salvation belongs to the Jews? And I have to search for some more for after reading that. And what I found out is this from the essay commentary. It says there that Jesus is above all prejudice. He wanted, as a Jew, to extend the blessing and the privileges that the Jews have to other nations, and to those who will be willing to accept him, who is the light of the world. Wow. Precious. And so at that time, 
the, the woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming and he will, th- he will say us these things. And Jesus said, I am he. And so the disciples came suddenly from, from the town and they saw Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman and they were surprised. But they didn't say anything. They were surprised. Why are they conversing to one another? Are they, is she not an outcast, unclean? What, why? But the woman left his jar. He went to the community. He went to the rest of the town. And she said, come, see, there was a man who told me everything I did. Can this be the Messiah? And we know the rest of the story. That woman and the community that, that has heard Jesus were converted. So the fact that this woman was Samaritan made her an outcast, right? She herself said to Jesus that Samaritans do not get along with the Jews, and there was a barrier between these two group of people. And furthermore, we saw the reactions of the disciples when they saw these two speaking to one another. But Jesus had to go through Samaria. Why? The same reason that he had with Zacchaeus. He had to bring his salvation to them. He wanted to give her living water and eternal life for the rest of the people in the Samaria. Now, the Jews, they only had condemnation and judgment for them. But Jesus had greeted them with love and as children's of God, children of God. So estranged as they were from the father's house, they were not estranged from the father's heart. Is that not beautiful? Amen. Another example, Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. The second to the last example that we have. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. This is about the lepers. Or the leper, let me correct myself. It says here, Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no one, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Lepers, once again, were, unclean, were considered unclean, right? So people back in the day, they consider that, oh, it's because they are sinful. That's why they are sick. God is putting a judgment on them. That's why they are sick. That's what the popular beliefs uh, people had back in that time. And because, because of this, the lepers, they did not, they, of course, they feel bad that they were sick. But the worst part is, the experience that they had, the, the, the rejection and the neglect the society had made them feel. Though you, there was a remarkable part of this story. The leper knew this, that he was an outcast, that he was unclean. But that didn't stop him from coming to Jesus, right? But still, what people noticed was, oh my goodness, Jesus touched him. Now he is also unclean. So touching a leper at that time can make a person unclean. That's what they believe. And Jesus could have just spoken the word. He said, Jesus can just speak, seek, say, be healed. But then he had to touch him. Why? Why? Why does he have to touch him? Because he needed to change the condition of that man. Who was before an outcast of the society, but is now healed and is again part of the society. I can touch you, 
once again. Jesus needed to change his condition. And lastly, this time, this is not Jesus, but Jesus' disciple mingling with the outcast. Ask Acts chapter 10, please. Acts chapter 10. This is about Peter and Cornelius, the centurion. Now let's summarize the story. Okay, there was a man named Cent- uh, Cornelius. He was in a centurion from the isn't reliable at the moment. From, from the Italian regiment. Okay? And he belongs to a family that fears God, helps the poor, and they pray regularly to God. And at one afternoon, there was a heard and talked to Cornelius and said, go to Joppa and send back a man named Simon Peter. He lived in, in, with Simon the Tanner by the sea. So send him back because I, I have an important message for you to know. I'm just making a summary of this. And so after hearing the message of the angel, he sent two servants and one soldier to go to Joppa and send for Peter. And at that time, Peter also, he, the next day, no, he was tired, he was hungry, he wanted to eat. But then while they were preparing food, God put him in a trance and he saw a vision like of a mantle coming down from heaven. And in that mantle were different animals, reptiles, birds, four-legged animals. And God said, get up, Peter, and eat. Kill and eat. And what did Peter say again? Oh, no. uh, No, my Lord. I have never uh, uh, eaten any unclean thing. And this happened three times. Three times until God pulled, pulled back the sheet. Uh, back to heaven. And then he said, he realized something. Okay, let's go back to this Bible verse. In verse 14, Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. But the voice spoke to him a second time and said, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. So while Peter was ponder, wondering about the meaning of the vision, the man sent by Cornelius found out where Peter was living. He asked, does Peter live here? And God spoke to Peter and said, Peter, come down, get downstairs. There were, I sent three men for you. Go with them. Go with them. For I have sent them. And Peter went down and said to the man, I'm the one you are looking for. Why have you come? And they went to Cornelius and Peter found out that he had to share Jesus to Cornelius. And Cornelius believed together with the rest of his close friends and his household. So we can see here in this story once again that there is a mingling with the outcasts. Now, brothers and sisters, Go back to the question, who are the unclean of our time? We have to give you a lot of examples from the Bible. We need to let the word of God sink in very, soak us very well to why is it important for us to mingle with the outcasts and who are the outcasts of our time? Who are the unclean of our time? Let's not go too far. Let's look at our church. Have you felt an outcast at some point in your life? I did. Who are the outcasts? Those maybe who have social status. Some who are poor or maybe not 
fortunate enough to have these material things. They said they were the outcasts of the church. Some who might have some bad experiences in their life, some bad past, and they feel that they cannot mingle with anybody. That's why they, they appear unfriendly in the church. Some whom we notice that, oh, they're not contributing much financially in the church. They can be considered an outcast too by some of us. We don't know what they are going through financially. Who else are the unclean, quote-unquote, of our time? Those maybe whom we assume inactive in the church, just because maybe we are involved in many ministries that many people see. Those maybe who are feeling like they are Zacchaeus, who have something in the public eye that is wrong, and they, are fear, they fear that they are judged, they fear that they are an outcast, unclean. Who are the out? Are we, have we experienced being an outcast? So, like, just like the Samaritan woman, as different nationality, have we? made someone feel like an outcast because their nationality is different. Language is not as fluent as ours. Or maybe they have lost their nationality because they were persecuted in their own country and they are seeking refuge where they are right now. Or maybe we considered People who are outcasts when they have different outlook in life than we, different outlook than we have. Because that's just the amount of light that they have received at that moment. But we consider them an outcast. Brothers and sisters, I want us to really think about this. Are we being the present Pharisees and Jews or Jewish leaders of this time? Do we regard ourselves as favorites of heaven, knowing the great measure of light we have received? How we think about others affect the feelings that we have towards one another. What do you think about your brothers and sisters right now? Look around you. What do you think of them? How, what you think of them affects how you feel about them. If you still feel that they are a stranger outside of your family blood relation, or if you still think that they are someone who is, who is not part of, of, of this holy group because they have done something wrong, then we are thinking. We are not thinking right. We have been reminded that Jesus called everybody. And, and what, how we live now, how we live now, how we treat one another now, how we act with someone's mistake now is a practice of how we will live in heaven for eternity with the rest of the brothers and sisters. How are we practicing our life for eternity here as a family of God? And if we have been the one who were outcast and have that hurt from the church maybe or from one brother or sister, I want to read this to you from Christ's object lesson. I'm almost done. It says here, and their very misery and sin made them only the more the objects of Jesus' com compassion. 
The farther they had wandered from him, the more earnest the longing and the greater the sacrifice for their rescue by Jesus. So tonight, I pray, we pray that we can look at each other's faces differently from now on. You know, when, Jesus, when, when the, the apostles were gathered in the upper room, they prayed together and they received the Holy Spirit. And after they received the Holy Spirit, they were filled with so much love for Jesus and with so much love for one another and for those whom Jesus died for. Now, we need to pray for the Holy Spirit this revival week as a church. We need to have that so much love for Jesus and for those whom Christ has died for. You will know that you are close to Jesus when the things that break his heart breaks yours. So if we haven't reached this point, let's pray for God to God tonight.